Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for your time. Uh, I think I'll be fairly brief, and then we'll go straight into questions. Uh, uh, today's uh, report um, signals the end of, uh, of uh, an inquiry that's um, taken place for uh, over two years. Uh, it was extensive, exhaustive. Uh, the Queensland Police Service assisted um, the CMC um, quite significantly. Uh, as you'll probably recall, when the Tesco matter broke publicly at the beginning of last year, there were um, quite serious allegations. Uh, in terms of the scale and the extent of uh, alleged Im improper practices. Uh, it's, it's good to see that um, those extreme claims have not been uh, uh, confirmed at all. Uh, having said that, any impropriety within the police department is a serious matter and one that uh, we take seriously and we need to deal with. Uh, we are, are an organisation of 15,000 people. Uh, and nearly 11,000 sworn police officers. We are one of the largest police departments in the English-speaking Western world. Uh, sadly, but inevitably, uh, from year to year, each year, some of our 15,000 people will let us down. What we need to do is to minimise the extent of that uh, to the greatest extent possible, but we also need to identify that misbehaviour and inappropriate behaviour where it occurs. And the CMC, of course, together with us, and we don't shirk from our responsibility in that space, have a vital role in that regard. I think that what this has done is demonstrate the thoroughness, the vigour, uh, the, the extent of the um, lengths that both organisations are prepared to go to to investigate improper practices in the police department. I'm obviously not pleased with what happened, um, but... I am pleased that the claims that were made at the beginning of last year uh, have not been substantiated. And you might recall those claims, they were along the uh, lines of uh, up to 20 uh, senior police involved in the importation and trafficking of dangerous drugs, uh, which implied systemic organised high level corruption. None of that has been substantiated and I do not believe that it ever existed nor does it exist now. Um, but certainly um, there's been learnings from this. Uh, as you recall, uh, towards the middle of last year we announced a number of initiatives. Uh, some of those are in place, some of those are still work in progress. Uh, and I think that those things, and I think the CMC indicate those things that we've done have been worthwhile. Um, so with those few words, uh, perhaps I could open it up to your questions. Uh, I, I think that um, the initiatives certainly have been very worthwhile, yes. Um, I think that um, it was necessary to have a thorough and comprehensive investigation because of the very serious nature of the claims made at the outset, uh, and that was important as well, and certainly that occurred. What are the learnings for the wider police force? Uh, that <laughs> that, um, that the, the price of um, being uh, a professional police department, um, it, it never ends, um, that we must constantly be on guard, uh, that we must be always of a mind to improve and do things better, but also we must um, be very careful about complacency, complacency and slippage. Uh, so certainly, you know, I think they're the two lessons. Always look for improvement, uh, but also always guard against slippage. Uh, where, uh, where it's been referred to, and I think, and, and forgive me because I just haven't had a chance to thoroughly read every page, but I think that what it says in there that the CMC have referred, which they have to us, a number of matters, uh, to consider taking disciplinary action, and that's what we're doing at the moment. And you have my assurance that if disciplinary action is appropriate, it will be taken in each and every case. Uh, there's some new legislation which I think is really quite good and for the two who are referenced there who've resigned, the recommendation and the potentiality is what's called a, a 7A procedure which basically means uh, a finding uh, even though the person's left. I mean, once someone leaves the police department, there's nothing more we can do. The, the most serious thing we can do to someone in the police department is to sack them. If they leave, they're gone. So we can't take disciplinary action against them. But this is a, a disciplinary finding, if you like, in their absence. And what it does, it's uh, on the person's record with us, 
And the intent and purpose of it, which I think is very worthwhile, is if they seek employment in another police department anywhere in Australia or if they seek employment in the public service in Queensland, that adverse finding is on their record. Uh, well, look, I'd like to think that we've always cooperated with the CMC, and certainly in this case we, and I think they've indicated that in the report, we provided significant resources to them, and again, that was because of the serious nature of the original allegations, which fortunately uh, haven't been substantiated at all. Um, look, I, I, there's always room for improvement, and, and I accept that within the police department there is currently room for improvement, uh, and we are certainly working toward, towards trying to achieve that. But I do believe that our culture is in good shape. Uh, there are many good aspects to the police culture. There is a commitment to the community. There are people who give hours and hours of unpaid overtime. Uh, there are people who work in isolated, remote, difficult areas of the state and stay there. Uh, there are our people who work in Indigenous communities that are dry communities, that are prepared to live there for years to work with the local community and sacrifice a lifestyle that many of us would not um, would, would miss greatly here. So there are lots of good aspects to the police culture. Um, the, the negative aspects have been well identified from the Fitzgerald inquiry and onwards, and I'm not going to sit here today and tell you that they've, they've, they've completely gone from every one of our 15,000 people. But I do believe we're in solid shape and I think we're well placed for the future. The um, officer who was prosecuted in criminal, criminal charges since he died, yes. uh, he didn't have a conviction recorded against him uh, over his drug charges. Did that surprise you? Uh, look, that's a matter for the court. Um, uh, I obviously, um, you know, uh, that would, and that's a matter for the magistrate that dealt with it, I guess, really, to make the determination. Um, but um, I don't think that has any bearing at all on that former officer's um, employability that potentially, you know, uh, certainly never be re-employed with us. Uh, and uh, I don't think it would ever be likely to be re-employed in the public, public sector. So despite the fact that no conviction was recorded, um, there was still, um, uh, I think, a plea of guilty uh, to... And I think it was a $4,000 fine, which is quite a significant fine. Do you know what the prosecutor's thought of the conviction? No, I don't. I can find out for you, but I, and I, can I come back to you on that? Yeah. Well, how is the union related to double standards to a certain extent, saying that uh, uh, the CMC hosts an anti-corruption uh, conference sponsored by a prominent mm. winemaker that you know, when yourselves and others are up north of the state, you know, you use p police cars to drive you from A to B, but yet when a, uh, a constable wants to use that sort of thing that they can't get, you know, a cheap <coughs> coffee, a dollar fifty off a of coffee, do you think that there's some merit in what they're saying? OK, can I try and work through that? Um, the, the first one is a matter for the CMC. I have no knowledge at all as to whether the CMC have ever been sponsored by, uh, by an alcohol company or a wine company. I have no, you'd have to go to the CMC on that. Um, uh, it, it, it's not unusual, though, for organisations hosting conferences to seek sponsorship. Um, uh, the second one, um, as I understood it, uh, that I get transport, indeed I do, um, whenever I, and I try to travel around Queensland as much as I can, uh, generally as a professional courtesy, the senior officer where I go uh, picks me up at the airport and quite often and usually drops me back at the airport later. Uh, I'm on duty, um, I uh, am working. Uh, when we're in the vehicle together we discuss you know, police issues. I think there is a vast difference between my doing that and an off-duty police officer getting a free lift home from licensed premises late at night. Uh, so I don't think there's a double standard there at all. Um, the third one, I'm sorry, could you just repeat that? That was about half price well, burgers. Cups of coffee when, you know, saying you're yeah. out and about, but on, yes. on duty that, you know, everyone, a lot of people would you know, yeah. coffee Can I talk about that for a little bit? Because that, that is a, a really quite interesting and significant topic. That relates to gifts, benefits, gratuities. Uh, now, what we say is this, and we're still finalising our policy and we're still in consultation with the police unions about this, and I think it would be really good and healthy to have a public debate about this. We don't shrink from that and we're happy to discuss it with the media at any time. Th there are clearly some things at one end of the spectrum that are totally, totally unacceptable in terms of gifts and gratuities, and they are free entry uh, for police into nightclubs. Uh, they include free alcohol or half-price alcohol in nightclubs 
which is not available to the public through a promotion. So the police officer is treated differently because they're a police officer. They include uh, receiving, obviously, kickbacks for arranging uh, tows at the scene of vehicle cr accidents. Um, now, at the other end of the spectrum, um, there is a benefit that I believe is quite acceptable, and that is the benefit of police officers travelling by trains um, free of charge, because I believe there is a community benefit there. Uh, there is a community benefit if the police, if police officers are using public transport, we have an expectation that if something happens, they'll become involved and deal with it, and I believe that adds to the safety of the travelling public who use public transport. So that's there, if I could, the two ends of the, uh, of, of the scale. Now, uh, towards the bottom end of the scale, in my view, is the issue of half-price hamburgers and discounted coffee and, and, uh, and that sort of thing, you know, from fast food outlets. Um, we're not saying uh, that that is corruption. I'm not saying that police officers who've engaged in that practice in the past and even would do so today and tomorrow are corrupt police. I'm also not saying that that, even though there is a view that this is the case, it's not my view, that that is what's called the slippery slope. In other words, that starts you on the path of corruption, that accepting a half-price burger somewhere at a fast food outlet starts you on the slippery slope to corruption. Some have that view, it's not my view. But what I do say is this, that I put that in the, in the category of, of practice and that, that is something we shouldn't do. Uh, I don't think it fits with us being a professional uh, police department and what we should aspire to be in terms of professionalism. I put it in a similar category. If hypothetically, and I hope you wouldn't, but if hypothetically you saw a police officer in uniform leaning up against the wall of a building with hands in pockets, perhaps chewing gum, with hat crooked, you would look at that person and say, gee, that's unprofessional. That's not a good image and look for a police officer. That's the category that I see this issue of the, the half-price burgers in. It, it's professionalism. It's how we appear to the public. And it's about where I would like the police department to be into the future in terms of what our, our own professional standards are. The, the uh, CMP said in its report there's still more work to do in regards to uh, drug and alcohol uh, yes. use by, potentially by officers. Do you think that random drug testing should be introduced? I know at, at the public meeting last year, the service gave the opinion that it would be effective. Uh, yeah, and look, I think from a, cost, from a pure cost-benefit analysis, I think, you know, that's probably still the case. Um, but, however, uh, I think that um, we, and it's under consideration at the moment, and I think it's something that may well, regardless of the cost-benefit analysis, the, the, just the, the bare bones of that, I think it's something that we may well have to introduce. Uh, it's also currently a recommendation of the most recent review uh, into the police discipline process, and it was recommended that there actually be an examination of, of the cost-benefit. That's my re recollection of the recommendation, anyway. Um, and I think we may uh, well have to explore going down that path. Do you think that might be tricky? How far along Yeah, look, look you'd have to... Um, it, it's a complex issue. Uh, can I just talk about that for a minute in terms of some of the, the complexity? Firstly, you'd need legislation change. Secondly, it's generally accepted that the best way and the only thorough way to do a drug test is a urine sample. Uh, we are a vast state. I have police from Coolangatta to Cape York uh, to, um, to um, Birdsville to Mornington Island. Um, to take a urine sample currently in Queensland under the current legislation, you have to be a doctor or a registered nurse. Um, this is an expensive business and logistically it's a difficult business to do it properly and to do it randomly uh, with nearly 11,000 police across the state. So it's not something, you know, where you say, look, this is really easy to introduce and it can be done overnight. There is a significant cost factor and there is a significant logistical factor to it. Um, but it needs to be explored and that's what's going to happen in the near future in terms of examining what it would cost um, and how we would roll it out in a practical sense if it were to happen. It's uh, I, I would understand their sensitivity, but we've introduced random alcohol testing, uh, and it is a fact uh, that um, uh, random drug testing takes place in other industries, such as the mining industry. Uh, and hopefully, if it does come in, if it does come in, because ultimately it's got to be a government decision. Okay, it's not one that I make; it'll be a government policy decision. And as I said, it would require legislative change, in my view. Well, it would, sorry, it would require legislative change because currently we can drug test police 
in a targeted sense. Okay, so if we have information or we suspect that an officer is using drugs, then we can conduct a urine test for drugs. But at the moment, it's not random, as it is, you know, for, for motorists. They can be uh, drug or breath tested. Anyone can driving a motor vehicle. So all of those, um, you know, things would, would need to be taken into account. But but I would hope that if if it does come in, that police would accept that it is part of the price of professionalism and that no one is being tested uh, if it's a random testing regime because people think, oh, you, sh you are using drugs and it's just a matter of trying to catch you, that that's not the case at all. And certainly our random testing with alcohol has, has met with a very, very uh, hardly ever is anyone, you know, uh, found to have consumed alcohol on duty, which I think is really uh, quite significant and a very good, very good thing. But just to clarify, are you pushing the government, pushing the government to introduce this? Is it you're saying that you're considering it, but is it something that you're already supporting and want to happen? No, no, what, well, let me restate um, that. Um, what I've said is uh, the government, it would be a, a policy decision that would be for the government finally, you know, to decide. And in my view, it would require legislative change, which the government are the only ones who can introduce. Um, what I've said was that previously, uh, my view was that the cost-benefit of it didn't justify it. But um, the world moves on, and I think we have to revisit that. And currently, there is a recommendation in the very latest um, discipline review report, which was by um, a lady named Simone Webb, uh, retired Supreme Court Justice Glenn Williams, and retired Assistant Commissioner Felix Grayson. This is one of the Government Commission, and I think it's on the Premier's website. And if you wish, I can, you know, come back to you with uh, the specific recommendation. I just don't have it, you know, with me at the moment. Um, but um, uh, it, it was to the effect that we revisit and re-examine this issue, which, which I'm sure is going to happen. Is it uh, uh, it's yes. Uh, the New South Wales Police and the Australian Federal Police, I believe, conduct random drug testing. Why do you? Uh, I, I think um, it's it, well. I think it's probably going to be inevitable. Uh, again, I think it's the, it's, a, it's a matter for the government to determine. But um, and we, as I said, we've got to get around the logistic pot, uh, issues, and obviously it'll need to be funded. Um, but I think that um, th there seems to be a view um, that that uh, and, and it is a changing world. And can I, I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, but I think it's the price of professionalism uh, as well. Um, you know, um, look, every time we have... We do do some drug testing now, I should have mentioned that. All of our recruits are tested for drugs on the second day they're at the police academy. Every single recruit is tested. Every time there is a critical incident, in other words, um, something where the police have to use their firearm and tragically someone might be shot... Uh, all of the officers involved in the critical incident are tested for alcohol and drugs. Okay, so that happens now, but it's limited, of course. Um, uh, but the latest research um, on Australian drug use, which I think was in 2007, uh, indicated that one in this is my recollection, uh, one in seven Australians admit regular illegal drug use, one in seven, and that 38 percent of Australians admit at some stage in their life having used an illegal drug. So the issues of illegal drugs, and generally they fall into four broad categories. There's cannabis, amphetamines, cocaine and opiates, in other words, heroin type, type substances. The, the, that increase sadly is within our society today, you know, over time. So we, the police come from the community. So, you know, uh, and, and that's obviously how it should be. But we're going to reflect society. So I think for, there's a range of reasons there why, why I see the argument to do this, okay, to bring this in. So why did you bring this up today? Why did I bring it up? Yeah. I thought you brought it up. Yeah. Um, how long do you think it'd be before he go into the, the, the Well, not, not you personally, but I thought that the media brought it up who were here today. The, I'm sorry. The decision on whether it proceeds, mm -hmm. um, I would think that will be done within a month. Within a month? Within a month. Yes. The, 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 if disciplinary action is taken, that in all probability would not be finalised within a month, but the decision as to whether to take disciplinary action should be complete within a month. And we undertake to uh, let you know the outcome of that of that decision, is that, if that's what you wish, OK? Mm -hmm.
Yeah, I hope so. I really do. I, 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 you know, I mean, we all know that it's a difficult working environment. We know the tragedy that occurred there recently, um, and uh, and I mean, just last night, you know, stolen vehicle, um, two people killed, uh, driver absconded. Um, yeah, it's a very, very busy place, and uh, uh, I think they do a fine job, and uh, I think they deserve support. Um, and um, I, I think that we'll all be pleased that this um, this report has been produced, and we can now move on. You know, it's a really good point, and I thank you for raising it. I, I said when I gave evidence at the hearings that our sergeants and senior sergeants are, in my view, the most important people in the organisation. And we have um, uh, approximately 2,200 sergeants and about 800 senior sergeants. So we have 3,000, we are a large police department, 3,000 sergeants and senior sergeants, and they are the heart of the organisation. Um, and uh, I truly believe they're our most important people. Uh, because they're the ones at the coalface and with the younger officers who are out on the street providing you know, the leadership for them. We have put extra supervisors in at the Gold Coast um, and um, the, the role of the supervi as supervisors can't be understated in terms of its importance and we are going to introduce a training program uh, for supervisors. We had hoped that would be two weeks uh, but again logistical and, um, and uh, other reasons uh, have had to bring that back to a week. So we're starting with a one-week course for supervisors and we'll bring them in from across the state or we'll train them locally, can provide that training locally. And I'm hopeful that over time we'll be able to expand that supervisor training. Have you got a, a target for that? I mean, this is a little while back now that we're talking. Yes. Um, where, where are you at? Just Gold Coast still not... Oh, no, no, sorry. This is beyond the Gold Coast. We're talking statewide. Oh, yes. Um, no, no, but it's 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 very close to starting, and uh, and uh, we'll be underway with it soon. And 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 I see that as something that really needs to expand. And um, you know, it's it's something that um, probably you know it's something we would like to have done a long time ago. But we have a police department in a geographical area the size of Queensland. Um, there are challenges in terms of of bringing people back to Brisbane for week, two week, three week, four week training programs. Specifically, is that the target um, senior officers who might be engaging or have a chance to identify as suitors? No, no, that's um, a separate thing entirely and that's uh, part of the work we do as well in terms of looking at you know people who are the subject of um, excessive complaints. Uh, or who um, their senior officers have a concern about, and obviously you'd expect us to do that, and we do. Do you think that should support cops? The Tesco report? Um, no, I don't. As far as the, the freebies go, the, the police union obviously have been very vigorous in saying that we're going to keep them, and mm. PPF cannot stop us, probably through an industrial law. Uh, yeah. Yeah, we'll only know that into the future, uh, and they're all very valid points. As I mentioned, uh, in terms of the gratuities, if we're talking about the half-price hamburger and the half-price coffee, or the free hamburger and free coffee, um, as I said, I don't see that as corruption, and I don't think that a police officer who has received a, a, a half-price or free hamburger is corrupt, uh, and I'm not saying it is, and I also don't believe, as some do, that that starts an officer on the path to corruption. I don't, don't, that's not my view. People hold that view, but it's not mine. But what I do believe is, and I mentioned this before, is that in terms of where I want to see the police department be, where I want to see individual police officers be, um, is, is highly, highly professional people um, who were well regarded by the community. Uh, I think this is something where we need to say, and we have, okay, it's time's up for this practice. Now, having said that, the union, and we are engaged in consultation with them at the moment, the union, as you quite rightly point out, have a very different view. Uh, they say there's nothing wrong in the practice. We already know 
that some proprietors of fast food outlets have flagged that they will not stop the practice. Uh, they intend to keep doing it. Um, now, uh, it may well be that there is a legal challenge ultimately to what we're trying to do here, uh, and the outcome of that, of course, will, if, if there is a legal challenge, the outcome of that would be a matter for the courts. And I think, to some extent, and I can't speak for other policing jurisdictions, but I think that certainly here in Australia, what we're saying here is, is quite possibly cutting edge, you know, in terms of, of where this sits. Um, but this has been a debate that's been going on for a long, long time, um, this issue, you know, of free hamburgers. And, and generally it's not free, it's half price, heavily discounted. And there, there are arguments for and there are arguments against. But I think, and those in the senior executive of the service share my view, that it's time to call it a day. Uh, whether we're right in that, um, time will tell. If the courts decide that they are allowed to keep the gratuities or the, the discounts, um, would you take other measures? Look, I, I think that's, that's too um, what if and too hypothetical. I think we take it a step at a time. Um, I'm committed to introducing this policy, but, but after proper consultation and consideration of of how we roll it out and um, what we do if, um, you know, in terms... And as I said, I don't see this as, as corruption. I want to really stress that point. Uh, what I'm talking about here is, is it's about professionalism and it's about image uh, of a police officer and what a police officer is and represents. Um, so that's where I see it sitting. Uh, and we've got a little bit to work through yet in terms of the rollout of the policy. But I have committed to it, as we've said equally, uh, that it's a no-brainer that free entry into nightclubs and free alcohol is not acceptable. And as we said, as said equally, that I think it's OK, it's fine for police to travel free on public transport because I think uh, they provide a community service in enhancing public safety. Uh, this one's a grey area and it's middle ground. That's the one about the discounted food. Have you at, uh, but we've got to have a position on it, and our position on it is that we think that um, time's up for it. Have you looked at other jurisdictions? Uh, we, we, yeah, yeah. Look, look, that's a body of work that um, we would have done, we are doing now, but, um, and um, I, I don't put this to you as an excuse for not having done so to date, um, but as you'll recall, back in December, you know, there were unprecedented flooding cyclones and natural disasters in Queensland, and we have been pretty much consumed by a lot of that, and the follow-up with that with the uh, Commission of Inquiry. So it's only been in recent times we've been able to re restart, you know, our work and our, our consultation process. Um, uh, we are doing at the moment uh, an examination of policies interstate uh, in, in similar police departments and we see those as being New Zealand, Canada, the United States and the United Kingdom, uh, similar um, police jurisdictions. Okay. And, and then he is Australia? Uh, yes, all, all of the other interstate jurisdictions, uh, New Zealand, Canada, the United States and the United Kingdom. They're the police jurisdictions we generally look at in a comparative sense. Now, thank you for your time. Okay.